Uh, hi, welcome. Good afternoon. I hope everybody had a great lunch. Um, welcome to the uh, afternoon session of uh, Camera Robotics with Telemetrics. We have a full room today, so I appreciate that. Um, got a couple of people still getting settled down in the back, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started while everybody takes their seats. Um, I'm David Workman, uh, Director of Sales with Telemetrics, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, camera robotics today. I wanted to give a, a brief history of uh, telemetrics. Um, Anthony C. Cuomo was a uh, chief engineer at Philips and was uh, the design lead on the team that invented Triax. <clears throat> As you know, Triax was a very widely adopted technology. It ended up winning an Emmy Award. Um, you know, really was a, a groundbreaking, changing technology on, in our industry. Uh, he left Philips and founded Telemetrics in 1973. Um, for the uh, first couple of years, uh, Telemetrics primarily made Triax based camera control systems, not just for Philip Kremers, but others as well. And it was uh, 1980 when we started making uh, camera robotic systems. Um, we've continuously pushed the envelope since then. We're now on our fifth generation of camera robotic systems, the S5 series. And uh, every generation has really uh, added new features, new functionality, and, uh, and with higher performance than the previous generation. Uh, before we get into the uh, technical part of the presentation, I do want to give a, just a quick overview of the product lineup, just so you understand how everything goes together. Uh, we have the um, LP, let me get my pointer here, um, LP S5 pan tilt head up in the corner here. This is our full size pan tilt head um, with a dual cradle for mounting the camera and the teleprompter um, on a separate mount. This is the slightly smaller HPS5, our mid-size pan tilt head. Um, these two products have pretty much the same performance, the same speed, the same smooth motion. Uh, the primary difference is the, um, the weight capacity. Uh, the uh, LP head has about a 90 pound capacity and the HP head has about a 40 pound capacity. But other than that, they're very uh, similar in their uh, features and feature set. Down here at the bottom, we have the new RE2 RoboEye uh, integrated PTZ. This is actually a new product that we've announced, which is uh, going to be shipping in Q1 of 2020. And then also down here in the bottom is the compact head. In previous generations of telemetrics products, we've always had three sizes. We've always had the small, the medium, and the large. But for the past two years with the um, uh, S5 series of products, we've only had the medium and large, and we're finally coming out with the CP head in the S5 series. So this is also brand new. Uh, we'll just start uh, shipping in probably just a couple of weeks now. <clears throat> On the controller side, we have the RCCP2A advanced controller. This is our newest, latest and greatest controller. Uh, this can be uh, configured with either the studio software package, is, which is what you see there on the screen. It can also be uh, used with our legislative software package, which is good for parliaments and um, city councils, state legislatures, things like that. And then down at the bottom is our smaller controller, the RCCPM modular controller. This is a um, simpler version of our bigger controller with a, a simplified user interface. Both of the controllers are not just robotics controllers. There is also a uh, full camera CCU as well. Um, again, with our history of starting out just being a camera control company, uh, we've carried that forward. So all of our robotics controllers provide full shading and painting functionality with cameras from Sony, Panasonic, Grass Valley, uh, Ikigami, Hitachi, JVC, Canon. And that gives you the ability to uh, do all of your shading and painting from within the robotics controller. And you can also mix and match that functionality with different, uh, different cameras. So if you do have a Sony camera and a Grass Valley camera side by side, you can have those controls right there on the same system. It makes it a very powerful combination. Over here, we have our TG4 uh, televator or track and trolley, and we also have a smaller size, the TG4M mini track and trolley. Uh, this is shown here with the EP7 televator. And then on the right-hand side is our OmniGlide roving pedestal, again with the EP7 Televator. And then down at the bottom is our uh, WPS5, the weatherproof pen tilt head. Um, this is actually a very uh, unique product in the industry. It's, it uses the same control board as the 
LP and HPS5, um, which makes it so that uh, you can do all of the same programmability, the same you know smooth motion, complex motion control in an outdoor head. So you get all of the same features and capabilities that you get with the uh, the indoor studio heads as well. Okay, so um, life life would be easy for us if uh, cameras were only in fixed positions. <laughs> Uh, or if you did have to move a camera around, it could be mounted on a really nice big stable dolly and you didn't have to go more than three feet off the ground because the taller you go, the, you know, the more uh, wobble you're going to get in the uh, in your pedestal. But but that's not reality. Uh, we have to provide a more dynamic show. We have to provide ways to move the camera around and get those nice shots that are more appealing to the audience. Um, so thinking about the uh, robotics uh, requirements in any kind of a broadcast environment, uh, and, and these are issues that all of the robotics manufacturers, not just telemetrics, uh, need to contend with. Um, you need to have a, a, an on-air camera movement that really emulates what a seasoned, experienced uh, manual operator would be able to achieve. So it has that nice, natural-looking mo movement to it. And uh, you want to be on a track or a pedestal with a small footprint. If you take up too much of your space, um, you know, studio space is at a premium and you can't have too much extraneous uh, space to, uh, to place your robotics. You need elevation that goes from really low to really tall. Um, you, need, you need a tall elevation unit to get those nice sweeping boom-like movements, you know, for those dramatic effects and your opening shots into your, into your show. It needs to be fast moving. You need to be able to get from one side of the studio to the other, or one side of the track to the other, or elevation up and down pretty quickly, but without making any noise. And um, these are things that are uh, at conflict with each other. Uh, you know, uh, camera robotics are mechanical things. Whenever you whenever you move something mechanical faster, it's going to make more noise. Whenever you have elevation that's taller you're going to have, you know, more potential for wobble. Um, you know, so the engineering that goes into uh, achieving all of these at one time is actually very, very difficult. Now, you need to make perfectly repeatable complex movements. You know, if you have your signature opening shot for your show, uh, you want to be able to recall that shot at every news uh, production every day, 365 days a year, and have it absolutely repeatable. Um, you know, and, and uh, uh, consistent. And you need to integrate with augmented and uh, virtual reality element environments, you know. So um, even the small market stations are adding some AR elements to the productions nowadays. And if you have any kind of backlash in your um, robotics, that's going to show up as, you know, movement in the position of your augmented elements on the screen. You need to have very precise high-end robotics in order to, uh, to get that successfully. And as my old friend Paul Turner would say, it shouldn't cost more than two balloons and a goldfish. I, I can't quite do the uh, English accent right, but you get the idea. But I've been in this uh, business for many, many years, and I've been able to pretty much prove conclusively that robotics equipment or broadcast equipment in general does cost more than two balloons and a goldfish. I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> I, I hear a few people laughing. I think that uh, some of you might know Paul, Paul Turner and have heard him say that. Uh, anyway, moving on. Um, as the leader in providing the ultra smooth camera robotics, um, telemetrics historically concentrated on track systems. We do have our Omni Glide roving pedestal now that we've been able to overcome some of those limitations. But historically, there's just no questions. Tracks would provide smoother motion than PEDs. But even with tracks, there's certain challenges and certain design considerations that you need to consider to eliminate camera wobble. So the basic systems of a track. So you're going to have the track itself. It can be floor mounted, ceiling mounted. You're going to have some kind of a dolly that sits on that track with a motor control and then wheels which move it, you know, on the direction of travel. <clears throat> but then we also have to add elevation to that. And elevation gets a little bit tricky because that's where your stability comes into play. Um, as you have a motor this is at the bottom of the trolley pushing it as soon as you start to move that trolley the top of your pedestal is going to try to you know swing back and forth you're going to get a, a little bit of a pendulum effect uh, if you go around a corner at a high speed you're going to get a centrifugal force which is going to want to make it you know want to lean outward um, you need to have a really sturdy column and a wider base gives you better stability uh, 
this brings us to uh, uh, you know some issues with the wheels. Um, there's a concept called bump amplification. When you have any kind of bit of dirt or grunge on the wheel itself, uh, that's going to make your dolly wobble just the slightest bit. And but because of the height of the pedestal, you're going to get a amplification of that wobble. Um, so you get a, an arc displacement. I mean, even just the slightest bit of gunk that's even thinner than a piece of paper is going to make a noticeable image shift in the uh, in the image. And also, the wheel material is a consideration as well. Um, if you have too soft of a wheel, you're going to get flat spots, and and these the the flat spots can actually be two ways. One is it can be ground down, so you actually have a permanent flat spot that's that's ground into the into the uh, material, or it can be just a temporary indentation from the um, from it sitting for too long in one spot. We're going to actually talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. But on the on the flip side, if you have too hard of material for your wheels, um, it's more susceptible to dirt and grime, and it's also noisy. So if you think about metal, you know, if you have a metal wheel on a metal track, no matter what you do, that's going to be really, really noisy and uh, unacceptable. So finding that right ideal material in the middle has actually taken us a long time to find that, but we, but we think that we finally have. We do have uh, uh, an exceptionally high performance wheel system. So the, the wheel design is important as well. So especially if you have a, a a joint between two sections of track, if there's any little tiny bit of um, a bump between two sections of track, or if you get any kind of dirt inside your wheel assembly, that all is going to impact your performance. So the approach that we've taken to uh, for this with our um, with our current generation of track system is that we have wheels that are in a v-shaped a vector at 45 degree angles so that it's not sitting directly on top of the track and you don't have any force that's going directly upward um, so instead of having the wheels up on top of the track where any type of gunk or, or dirt on the track is going to directly translate into a swaying motion of the pendulum or of the uh, tele elevation unit we have the motion vectors going off at opposing 45 degree angles. So they kind of gives you kind of a auto cancellation effect um, on that. And that, that re really does work uh, very, very well. Um, you we, ca we call it a double bump avoidance. So um, we also have two sizes of wheels. We have two smaller wheels and two larger wheels, which are now spinning at different rates. So if you do have a little bit of gunk on two different wheels, um, they're not going to be going at the same time. Since those are spinning at different speeds, they're, they're going, going to be um, not adding to the, uh, they're going to be canceling each other instead of adding to each other. So again, we, we've looked at many different um, track designs over the years, and so of the other manufacturers, uh, you know, there's there's a, a number of ways to approach the problem. We really do think that the uh, TG4 trapezoidal extruded uh, track design really does perform the best. This is the one area where, you know, I'm, I'm going to stand up and say that uh, that we've done this right <laughs> um, and, uh, and really do get the best performance out of it. Um, there's a couple of other advantages of this design is it really does, it gives us the ability to have both a floor and a ceiling mount configuration. So right here we have the uh, wheel design on a floor mount track with the whole trolley and televator on top of the track. <clears throat> and then over here by just adding this extension piece right here on the side, we can then hang the whole trolley and televator from the track and make that a, a ceiling mount track. Um, and really that's the only thing that's different between this is just the, the wheels are flipped upside down and we have this extension piece here. The rest of the trolley is the same, the televator is the same, the pan tilt head is the same. This makes it much easier for maintaining our design, uh, for inventory control in the factory, uh, for you know getting parts and pieces out to, to customers when we need to because it's just, it's just a much simpler design overall and it makes it very flexible for both ceiling and floor mount configurations. Okay, so we've talked about the wheels. Um, you know, I think that I've shown uh, what we can do with our wheel system uh, so that we don't get any bumps in the wheels. But then you also have a problem with 
um, the trolley itself, keeping the the whole base of the trolley stable in as small of a footprint as possible. Um, you probably all have been to a, a restaurant and you sit down at the table and the table wobbles and you have to call the waiter over and they put a piece of cardboard under one of the feet. Um, unless you have exactly the same length feet on a four-legged table, it's going to wobble. But when you have three legs, it doesn't. So that's why the three-point support system really is best on a on a track system. Um, you know, so we don't get the we don't get any wobble in the wheels. We don't get any wobbles on the trolley itself. Um, and you know, we think that's the best of both worlds. Now, there's one more thing to consider here, and that's uh, the the placement of the tracks. Um, when you have a curved track the two rails might not be perfectly parallel. And this is particularly an issue if you have like an S-shaped track where you have two back-to-back -back curved track sections, one going one direction, one going another direction, possibly at a different radius. Um, as you transition from one track section at one radius to another track section going the other way at a different radius, keeping the rail sections perfectly parallel is almost impossible. So that front uh, track wheel assembly is on a slider that slides back and forth and pretty much completely eliminates that problem. Absolutely no issues with that at all. We can we can traverse, we can go from straight track to curved track or from curved track to, to you know a different curved track. We can do uh, ovals, C shape, S shape, pretty much any track configuration and there's absolutely no problem with the um, you know maintaining the parallel uh, tracks. Okay so here's a um, an example of our uh, our longest televator. This is the EP7-1000. We have two shorter versions of the televator, but this is the longest one up on a ceiling track. Um, and as you can see, we're uh, going along and, and there is a track joint there in the middle of that track section. So um, we are going over a track uh, joint between two track sections right there. And uh, we go down once, and we only go down this time to about the uh, that windowsill there. You can see it. And then um, we're going to go back here <clears throat> and go up again. And this time the uh, and you can see there's some panning on the uh, pan tilt head as well. And we're going to go all the way down to the maximum full extension here, which is about 11 and a half feet. So that's a really, really, really long extension. If there was any issues with the uh, track integrity, you're going to see, you know, quite a bit of pendulum effect on that. And as you can see, it's absolutely perfectly stable. Okay, so some other design considerations when you're designing chem robotics. Uh, we use full servo motors instead of stepper motors. Stepper motors are used in low-end uh, PTZ camera heads, but they really don't perform that well. Um, full servos give you much, much smoother motion, particularly at low speeds. And probably you've all noticed that with some of these small PTZ cameras, um, when you do a smooth, a, a low speed pan or tilt or a diagonal move in particular at a very high zoom, you're going to see the steps in the stepper motor and you're going to actually see it going kunk, 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 kunk. Uh, it really makes it unusable uh, for an on-air on -air mo movement. Um, servos give you also give you a very linear torque from low speed to high speed so that you can get that acceleration profile and you know from the control system you know how you're going to accelerate that motor and and keep control of it. Um, you have to take care of your horizontal and vertical balance. So this is something that um, to reduce the motor stress, you need to make sure that the load that's on the pan tilt head is always properly balanced. Uh, if you think about, you know, it's, it's easy to imagine your horizontal balance. Everybody understands that. If you have the camera too far forward or too far back, um, you know, it's going to want to tip the whole pan tilt head assembly forwards or backwards, you know, because uh, your, your center of gravity is off. But you also have to think about your vertical balance as well, because if your camera is perfectly centered in the middle, it's not too far forward, it's not too far back, but it's down, then you get kind of a pendulum effect when you try to pan it up and down. You know, because if it's hanging, let's say it's hanging six inches down from the bottom of the, of the axis of pivot, 
it's not just panning forward if it was on the axis of pivot it's actually swinging up and swinging down as it goes backwards and forwards so um, you need to get your horizontal and vertical balance just right not only to reduce the mo the stress the motor stress but also so that it doesn't want to move on its own um, when you let go because if you're running it in manual mode you know in between you can go back and forth between manual mode or robotic mode and you let go of it you want it to be perfectly balanced so it, it'll stay there where it's at and not you know not try to recenter itself uh, and then uh, belt drives rather than worm gears or chain drives uh, belt drives are much more precise low maintenance um, and with modern materials they they really have no stretch they, they last forever they're quiet um, worm gears are quiet as well uh, but chain drives are the worst you know um, <clears throat> These are no matter what you do to a chain drive, it's going to be noisy, and you want to get get those out of your out of your studio as much as possible. All right, so controlling the motors in a camera robotics. So you know if you have a a trolley that's on a track with a six foot high pedestal, you can't just turn on the motor and have it go ticking off like a jackrabbit. The whole thing's going to fall over. <laughs> um, you know, you'd have to have some kind of ramping of your acceleration, but most of the low-end robotics in the PTZ cameras just apply a linear interpolation. That still will not get you a smooth start and stop. You're still going to see it jerk as it starts moving and, and kind of bobble when it stops moving. Uh, you, what you need to do is apply a proper smooth linear interpolation with acceleration and deceleration. Um, it's not all of that hard to do, but you need to understand the ballistics of the motor themselves. You need to understand how much current is going through the motors and how much load you're moving. And that load needs to include the, uh, the teleprompters and the cameras and the lens. And you need to look at how fast you're going and how far you need to go. So if you're moving a track all the way across from one side of the studio to the other, you need to see, you know, you need to understand through the ballistics of the motors how much ramp up time you need and how much ramp time downtime you need uh, to get there within the timing of that shot. And really to get that right, and this is uh, again where even some of the other higher you know, higher end manufacturers get tripped up, is converging all of those axes at one time. Because you know, if you're panning a little bit and then tilting some and zooming and focusing while moving your elevation and your track position all at once. You want all of those to come together at a perfect stop at the same time with no overshoot and no wobble. It just stops. And that's that's really tough to do. So I've got another video here. Um, the uh, the picture in picture there shows the output of the camera um, that's being recorded. So I've got a track move. My elevation goes up, then down. I've got panning and a little bit of tilt, but not too much. And I am zooming there and it just comes together perfectly at a perfect stop. And again, that's uh, very, very, very difficult to do. Okay, so moving on from tracks to our new uh, OmniGlide uh, roving pedestal. Again, like I said earlier, um, historically telemetrics has concentrated on the track systems because we felt that's the only way that you could get that ultra smooth motion. And we've wanted to, do a roving, wanted to do a roving pedestal for a number of years, but we wanted to make sure that we could overcome a lot of these issues that uh, the existing rovers have that are in the marketplace. And we think that we've uh, accomplished that. Um, but it's a very complex design and there was a, a lot of challenges that needed to be overcome. So there, there are some similarities between rovers and track systems. Um, as with the track systems, the wheel hardness is critically important. So like I said before, if you have soft materials, it'll develop flat, flat spots. Um, but if hard materials are more sensitive to irregular, irregularities in the floor and might not have enough grip. So if you have a very smooth um, ceramic tile with a glass-like surface, some of the existing uh, roving pedestals that are out there, they're going to spin the wheels a little bit before they actually start moving. And the, the performance really, really suffers when that happens. Um, and ag again, like I said before, with the flat spots, this isn't permanent flat spots. The, you know, these are, if you have this 400 pound beast that's sitting there overnight in one spot, the, the wheel material is going to partially indent. And then when you first start moving it in the morning, it's got a, you know, 
hump up over that uh, over that flat spot in order to start moving. Um, those spots usually rebound, you know, 20 minutes, half hour later, it's going to be fine. But when you first start moving it in the morning after, you know, after sitting overnight, that, that might be an issue. Um, as with track systems, three point contact is best for stability. Uh, pretty much all of the four point, you know, four wheeled uh, uh, rover systems that are out there, you know, have stability problems. And then Another consideration that you have with um, rovers that you don't have with tracks is the floor material itself, and this is this is an issue that you know um, all rovers deal with, inclu including us. We've found that poured self-leveling epoxy or cement is best. Uh, that's about the best floor material you can get. Um, cement does tend to crack sometimes. Little hairline cracks are not a problem as long as there's no you know open gaps between you know or, or uh, chips you know that are chipped out. Um, the seamless ceramic tiles are also very good, again, with uh, the material that we have for our um, wheel assembly. Uh, we don't worry about, uh, we can grip to um, a perfectly smooth uh, seamless uh, ceramic tile. The one material that we have had some issues with is there's certain types of vinyls. Some, some vinyls are okay, but other vinyls have caused some problems. Even if they have a high PSI rating, we have customers that say, I've got a, a vinyl floor that's got 2000 PSI, um, but that's really just the puncture strength. That's, you know, that's really the strength that's required to puncture through the vinyl, but the vinyl itself will still develop flat spots itself so you you know you have the the potential for flat spots in the wheels and then the potential for flat spots on the on the vinyl surface if it's too soft um you know so that's that's something to uh, to think about when you're when you're uh, considering what uh floor material to put down in your studio okay so there's kind of two existing designs that are traditionally used in the rovers that are in the marketplace today um you have the synchronized steering wheels, which uh, has a chain, typically has a chain that goes around all four wheels. And again, chains, they're, they're noisy, um, you know, they're, they're uh, complicated to maintain, but you have to steer all four wheels to get a crabbing motion. You know, they, they can't spin on their own axes. You need some form of turning radius. So, you know, if you think about your car with wheels, you know, it can't just if it's facing in one direction, you want to go to the right exactly. You need to have some some radius to, to steer it that way to get there. The other the other design that's popular in the marketplace is a three wheeled um, design with two large drive wheels and then one smaller steer, steering wheel. And this actually in general does work better, but the whole platform has to turn in order to move in one direction. And when the platform turns, that means you are elevating pedestal turns as well. And also the that means that the head has to counter pan to get back your shot back in frame. And it makes it almost impossible to have this turning while you're on air and counter pan the head to operate it so that you keep your subject uh, in frame at all times while you're doing an on air move. Um, so to show how, how we've overcome that, we'd like to introduce OmniGlide. Um, OmniGlide, we got rid of the wheels. Uh, there's no traditional wheel system in our roving pedestal. We use an omnidirectional orbital drive system. And the, uh, the orbital drive has independent servo motors on each of the assemblies. And this allows you to do on the fly directional changes. Um, you can go in any direction, you can go forward, backward, side to side, diagonal, and a figure eight turn um, absolutely smoothly. And just like our track system, it's based on a platform that has a three wheel contact. So it's, it's very, very stable. And um, it really does provide that ultra smooth motion that we were aiming for, that we were trying to emulate, that we've always had in our track system. To, to, to illustrate here with the um, OmniGlide, uh, right here, if you're starting out this position, you wanna do this S type movement, you can move the OmniGlide pretty much in any direction, in any motion path that you want to without turning the um, uh, the, the base of the pedestal and you know without the elevation column turning at all either. So most of the others, 
if you're pointing in this direction, you actually have to spin it then to, to move it in that direction, but then your head's moving that direction also. So you have to counter pan the head to be moving that to, you know, be facing forward. But then if you want to move that way down in this direction, then again, you have to counter pan the head upward this way to, to keep your shot in, in frame. We can actually, with uh, OmniGlide, we can actually do a figure eight move without counter panning the head. We can keep it um, all centered uh, at, at the same time. So here's another uh, video to show that. So we're going to move off to the side here. And then we're going to go backwards at a diagonal. So back and to the side without the base or the televator or the head changing axes. And then we're going to go forward and diagonal. Again, keeping your shot framed um, the whole time. And then again, coming forward with a bit of a elevation move there and a little bit of a pan and tilt. So that makes it very, very, very simple for the operator to control. And here we're just, you know, kind of having fun with it, uh, kind of showing with some of the things you can do. Again, having independently controlled servos on each of those orbital drives, you can do uh, some, some pretty fancy stuff. Now you can do this manually. You can program it into a keyframe move like this. Um, you know, the, the amount of control that you have is, uh, uh, is pretty incredible. And as you can see, that's um, that's just our factory floor in our manufacturing area. It's it's not the greatest floor in the world, but uh, you can look at the video coming out of this camera, and um, it's going to be on air quality, uh, you know, on that uh, on that flooring. Okay, so um, there's a couple of other things that I want to mention. We use an absolute positioning system that uh, does not need to be rehomed ever. So um, you can save a shot anywhere in your studio. You can recall that shot a year later. It's going to come back exactly to that same position. Um, we have both uh, fully robotic and manual operation modes. And then we also have a non-contact uh, collision avoidance system with um, uh, 3D laser scanners that basically map out where you are in the room and it will tell you if you're about to run into something. So as the OmniGlide is moving, if there's a person or a set piece or something, it's going to give you a warning and then it's going to stop before it bumps into something. Um, this, is, this is an issue that we hear about with the other uh, roving pedestals continuously is that people are complaining about they they bump into things so you know and uh, or they take off on their own <laughs> so you know these these are some of the issues that we had as design goals well when we designed uh, OmniGlide and I think that we've uh, succeeded brilliantly um, it really does have that uh, that performance that we were shooting for um, in the system and here's a, a picture of it uh, in a studio Okay, so I uh, appreciate everybody's time. I know that uh, you guys have uh, just finished lunch a little bit ago, and um, uh, you're probably just uh, getting your afternoon going, and I know you've got more sessions to attend. So thank you for your time, and I'm going to be here for a few more minutes if you have some questions. All right, I have some questions back there in the back.